What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Providence Perspective. I'm Jay, the Reformed Puerto Rican Dude, your host. Thank you very much for joining me. I'm excited to have you because we're going to be talking about something that I, I think I've struggled with. And I know that there's a lot of people out there that they still struggle with the law and the gospel, right? How do we distinguish them? And how do we still apply the law, right? A lot of people seem to overemphasize the gospel, and there's really not much law in their theology, right? And so uh, you see it a lot nowadays in most of the church, right, where there's this almost like diminishment of the law. And it's almost like an allergic uh, feeling towards the law. Like somehow the law is bad, right? Because the law doesn't help me gain salvation. So that's that's exactly what I wanted to talk to you guys about. Because I do believe that scripture does make a case for the fact that the law still matters. Now, We're going to talk about this in just a little bit. The law doesn't save, right? That's not what I'm saying at all. The law does not save. The law only condemns. But the law is helpful and it is good. Uh, It it just, we cannot, we cannot as Christians simply dismiss the law and, and just say, well, you know, I'm not under law, but under grace. Well, that's true. But Does that mean that we get rid of the law, right? So let's go ahead and get right into it. So, you know, that's the first thing that I wanted to talk about, right? Like how most Christians perceive the law nowadays, right? It's no law, just gospel, right? You have Galatians 5.1, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery, which of course is talking about trying to keep the law to gain salvation, which sounds very much like, hey, maybe the law doesn't matter, right? Maybe the law is not that important anymore because I'm not under law, but under grace. Well, you know, the scriptures don't really say that. And we have to be very careful with how we understand these things. Now, I can understand the temptation to think like this, to say no law, just gospel now, right? We were once under law, but now we're under the gospel and that's it. We're under grace, excuse me. But the problem is that the law speaks on something that never really goes away, which is righteousness, okay? So let me go ahead and go through this this presentation, okay? Um, A lot of people will say to you, the law was something from the Old Testament, right? The law doesn't really apply in the New Testament. The problem with that is that the New Testament does indeed affirm the law in many texts, in many, many texts. For example, some of the ones that I have right here, John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. What are commandments? They are the law of God, right? And so this is Jesus speaking, saying, you will keep my law, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, right? There's already an application there with the law. Hey, you want to love Jesus? You want to show love for God? And we'll talk more about that later. This is how you love him. You keep his commandments. You keep his law. Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Jesus is very explicit on this one. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now, some people might say to me, well, you see, it says it right there that nothing will be abolished until they are fulfilled. Because Jesus said that he didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. And so he has fulfilled the law on our behalf, right? So obviously that means that Jesus no longer expects us to keep the law. The problem with that logic is that although I can say absolutely, praise the Lord, hallelujah, amen, he has kept the law on our behalf, 100%. There's no doubt about that. But in the next sentence, he says, until heaven and earth pass away, 
not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So you can say, well, see, he's talking about until all is accomplished. Well, he accomplished everything on the cross. In a sense, yes. But he also says until heaven and earth pass away. Have heaven and earth passed away? We're still here, right? We're still waiting for a new heavens and a new earth. Last time I checked. That's what he's talking about. He's saying until heaven and earth themselves pass away, as you know them, the law will not pass. The law will not pass away. And so we have to take that seriously. Okay? Romans 3.31. Do we then overthrow, overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. This is Paul speaking, right? And he has laid out how we are saved by faith. But then he, all of, out of nowhere, says this. Absolutely not. We don't get rid of the law just because we have faith. We uphold the law. The law is still in effect. Romans 7.16 now, if I do not do what I, or I'm sorry, not if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. See, the law is not bad. The law is indeed very good. It's a good thing. God gave the law for a reason. God gave moral standards for a reason. It's not something to get rid of. It's actually something good and wonderful and beautiful. The problem is that we think, I can't keep the law. I can't do it. And so you're tying the law constantly to salvation. So what do we do with the law, right? That's the question. What do we do with the law? First of all, I just want to address this. I already kind of mentioned it, but are you saying that we need to keep the law to be saved? No. In the same chapter, right? I just read uh, Romans 3.31, where it says that we uphold the law. In the same chapter, Romans 3.20, a couple of verses earlier, Paul says, by, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. And of course, we know this next passage, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So, no. <laughs> There's nothing that we can do. No keeping of law, no good deeds, nothing we can do to earn our salvation. But as I mentioned earlier, then what do we do with the law? That's the question that we really want to know, right? What do we do with the law then? Well, here's the answer. We distinguish it from the gospel without separating it from the gospel. The law, like I mentioned, is still useful, it's still necessary, and it's still good. If you know what to do with the law, you know, um, you actually realize that it is good. It is actually useful. In fact, it is necessary. So let's think about what I just said, right? Distinguish it from the gospel without separating it from the gospel. So what we want to do is we don't want to preach a gospel that is based on works-based salvation. That's a false gospel. However, the law absolutely points to your need for the gospel. Right? And we're going to talk about what the law does. We can also briefly talk about how we can divide the law, but, but we're going to talk specifically about what the law does. So, for example, let's say I go preach the gospel to some unbeliever, right? What am I going to start with? Well, typically, I'm going to start with God has these standards. God has these standards that you have not met. And so you will be condemned on the day of judgment. But I have good news. And that's when I give them the gospel. You see, these things can come together. Because if I say to somebody, if I say to somebody, hey, Jesus loves you, man. He died for your sins. Well, that's great. Fantastic. I'm out of here. We don't see the Paul, the, the Paul, the apostles doing that, right? Especially in the book of Acts, we see a lot of um, 
examples of how the gospel ought to be preached, they usually start with God's standards. What are God's standards? His law. His law. And they point that out over and over again to their audience. They say, look, this is what you've done against God. Right? There is no good news without the bad news first. You have broken his commandments. You have broken his moral standards. That's the law of God, guys. It's very simple. Um, so again, we cannot separate the law from the gospel. We do need to distinguish it because the gospel is not law. Law is not the gospel. And you cannot be saved by the law. And the, the, the gospel does not condemn. The law does condemn right? But there's a good aspect to that. Now, let's get into a little bit more of what the law is useful for. Obviously, we already kind of covered a little bit of it. We talked about, hey, the law is useful for preaching the gospel because it points people to their need for the gospel. And so what I wanted to talk to you about is the reformed doctrine of the three uses of the law. Now, this is a, uh, a doctrine used in um, in Lutheranism as well. So I don't want to make it just a reform thing, but I just wanted to point out that it is a reformed view, right? This is when we say reformed, we're not merely talking about a denomination. I believe that re when we talk about reformed, we're talking about reforming back to what Scripture says. And so, if you actually look at what Scripture says you will find out that the law has primarily three uses. There are three ways to use it. This is not to be confused, by the way. This is not to be confused with the threefold division of the law, right? Because there's there's a division of the law where we, um, and, and some people might disagree with this. That's for another video. But basically, um, we have the moral law, right? The moral standards of God. We have the judicial judicial law that we find in the Old Testament, it is the civil laws that God gave to the nation state of Israel, uh, which have been done away with, except for their moral principles. And uh, that's why I'm a theonomist. <laughs> and then you have uh, the ceremonial law, which was pointing to Christ. And so that has been done away with and it has been fulfilled completely. There's nothing more to do in that regard with the ceremonial laws because they were uh, types and shadows of what was to come. Christ has come, therefore there is no more need to offer things like animal sacrifices, right? Those are the three divisions of the law, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm, I'm talking about how we use the law, okay? And number one, the law is like a mirror, right? The law is like a mirror. We talked about this already, really. When we preach the gospel, we're supposed to uphold the law in the face of sinners, like a mirror. It shows them the righteousness of God, and it shows them how sinful they are compared to God's perfect standards. So it shows you your need for the gospel. That's really the first use of the law. The second use of the law is the restraint of evil. It's like a shield, right? The law cannot change your heart. As we've already talked, only the gospel talked about. Only the gospel can do that. However, the God, the, the gospel, the law, the second use of law, serves to protect people who are trying to live quiet and peaceful lives from people who are constantly trying to sin against them. And this is where we get into why the law still applies to even government. God's moral standards still apply to government. They are supposed to, uh, government, I mean, supposed to establish just laws. If you read Romans 13, a lot of people like to uh, use Romans 13 to say, well, you see, we have to submit to the governing authorities. But what Paul says in Romans 13 is that these governing authorities are supposed to stand for justice. They are supposed to be protectors of the people, essentially, right? when they use the law correctly, when they establish just laws. The law can be used as a shield. Now, that's not only the civil government's job, right? Um, we can use the law as a shield in the church as well, right? If somebody is doing, is committing sin, unrepentant sin, well, we can use the law to 
put to put them under church discipline as well, right? And there's different contexts to how we do that and when, right? There is a difference between a sin and a crime. So there is that that uh, distinction. Uh, uh, a crime is always a sin. Well, generally speaking, a crime is almost always a sin. Uh, if if the the civil authorities establish just laws, then a crime is always a sin. That part is true. Uh, if they establish unjust laws, and a, cri a crime is not necessarily always a sin. For example, it could be a crime to stop somebody from having an abortion. Well, that is a crime according to an unjust law, but that is not a sin. You're actually doing a good thing. You're saving a life. So in that case, no, a crime would not be a sin. But generally speaking, a crime is almost always a sin. But a sin is not always a crime. For example, I could lie. Lying is a sin but it is not a crime. Now, if I lie in a court of law, now it's a crime, right? So the, the context matters, but we have to make that distinction. Nevertheless, the, the second use of the law can be used by both government and church to protect people from evildoers. And so that's the second use of the law. The third use of the law, uh, you know, I put compass and most people use compass as an example. I, I like to think of it more like a guide Although a compass is a guide, but you know, it's easier to say guide for me than compass. Compass is a weird word for me. Compass. Anyway, <laughs> so the perp the third reason why we or I'm sorry, the, the uh third use of the law is to show us how to please God. Right? So let's say you use the first use of the law to show somebody their sinfulness and God's perfect standards. And they say, Yes, you're right. I repent. I want to trust in this Jesus. I believe in him. Now what do I do? Right? This guy starts going to church. And this is where a lot of churches fail. This is where a lot of churches fail. Well, we can talk about the second use of the law, how a lot of Christians don't want to use the second use of the law to tell government, hey, you're being unjust. You need to establish just laws. That's your job that, that God has given you. Right? You are a civil magistrate. So there's that problem, right? They don't want to uphold the law towards government and say, repent of your sin and establish just laws. That's the first problem. But the second problem is that they don't really want to, uh, or, or I wouldn't even necessarily say want to. Sometimes they just don't know how to discipline people. They don't know how to use the law to establish good, faithful discipleship. A lot of churches, what they do is that they overemphasize the gospel. And so the, they'll, they'll talk about sin. They'll say, yes, sin is bad. But you know what? Just look to Christ and remember the gospel. Amen. Absolutely. Nothing wrong with that. We need to rest in Christ. We can't just um, try to work harder and harder and harder against our sin. No, we need to rest in Christ. We are struggling. We're imperfect. We need to depend on Christ. However, there's also an application here. Right? Um, the Bible talks about testing ourselves to see if we are in the faith. James 2 talks very clearly about showing your faith by your works, right? Specifically, good works, which, by the way, if you follow the law of God, you're going to do good works. So how do we use the law? Well, it's a compass. It's a guide. It's no longer something that condemns us. Right? A lot of people like to say, well, I'm not under the law, but under grace. Amen. Hallelujah. You're not under the law for salvation. But you know what? You are a slave to Christ. You're no longer a slave to unrighteousness. You're a slave to righteousness. You're always going to be a slave one way or another. But where is the true freedom found? In Christ. And as a slave, a slave of Christ who loves him, who wants to please him, who wants to do what is good and right because he has died for you and redeemed you, as a result of that, you should be able to get up and say, Lord, where then should I go? As David says, your law is a lamp unto my feet, right? It's a guide. The law is not a bad thing. And in fact, it makes us better Christians. Because it tells us, this is how we please God. This is how we love God. This is how we love our neighbor. This is how we love. 
by following God's perfect standards, knowing full well that we won't always be able to keep them perfectly, understanding that we are forgiven when we fail to keep them, and knowing that we are now no longer condemned by them, but still striving for that, not out of fear, but out of love, because we love God, because we love our neighbor, because we love the fact that we have been redeemed and want to share that with others and want to glorify God in all aspects of life. If the Bible tells you that whatever you do, glorify God with everything, which it does, then how do we glorify God? Well, one of the ways is keeping his commandments. As Jesus said earlier, John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Amen. There's a lot more I could say about that, guys. Um, but I just wanted to do a brief video on a problem that we see often in the church today. It's rampant, right? Outside, even actually, even within reform camps, sadly, if you if you saw my video on the different reform camps, you know, you you have the the isolation isolationist antinomians who just say, look to Christ. You know, they minimize the law. They don't completely dismiss the law, but they, they don't really want to talk about the law. They don't want to emphasize the law. They just want to focus on rest in Christ. Just rest in Christ. Just rest in Christ, right? And that's not the way it works. You know, Christ, we we have been redeemed. You know, it's it's funny. We were talking about Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And how it says that um, we are not saved by our works, right? We are saved by grace through faith. Amen. But if you read the next verse, verse 10 on, on Ephesians 2.10, it actually says that we've been saved for a purpose, for good works, to glorify God. Well, how do we know how to do our job? The law of God. You know, a lot of people say first it was law and then it's gospel. Well, that's partially true. The reality is that it's first law, then gospel, and then law and gospel together. Right? That's why we don't we don't uh, separate them. We remember the gospel and we keep the law. And sometimes we'll fail to keep the law and we remember the gospel and we keep the law and we keep working and serving our Savior for the glory of God in every aspect of life. Amen. I hope this is helpful. Maybe you have a friend that's struggling with this. Hopefully this video will be able to help them out. Make sure to send it to them. Guys, if you like the video, I have been forgetting to mention this, but if you like the video, give it a like. It actually helps me reach a wider audience, which is my goal, right? I want people to know more about this stuff. I want people to not be scared of the law, right? That the law can actually be good without condemning you to hell, <laughs> you know, if, if you believe in Christ. Uh, so yeah, go ahead and give it a like. Let me know what you think in the comments. Let me know if you have any questions. Guys, until next time, God bless you. Take care.